So as I stated with today's uh, presentation, I'm going to be working on a landscape. And I did some pre-work for you so I could kind of speed the process up. Um, I put down regular masking tape. I don't like to use the blue artist tape because it disturbs my color in my mind. It's so blue that I'm really, you know, it kind of upsets the apple cart for me when I'm thinking about color. So if I do something more neutral, just like your basic masking tape, that really helps me out. Now you can see on this also, I edged all of the masking tape that where the trees are, the birch trees, or aspens, either way. Um, I've uh, edged them with masking fluid. Now the kind I like to use is by Richeson, and it's basically liquid latex, and I don't put it on with a brush. Even for my poured pieces, I never use a brush. You gotta soap it up, and you eventually you end up wrecking a brush. Well, brushes are expensive, so um, I use a palette knife, and it's it works great. I can get tiny little eyelashes or, or strands of hair. Um, I can trowel it on like I'm frosting cupcakes. So using a palette knife really works. So I, I thin this out because most masking fluid, except Wins Windsor Newton, that one comes really thin. You do not want to dilute that more. But the Jack Richardson brand is so concentrated that I, I dilute it quite a bit. It's almost like a <clears throat> like a whipping cream when it comes out. Maybe even thin like a half and half, more like a half and half. Um, and I put it in a little container because I want to hold it. I don't want to do this and tip it over. Mm -hmm. I've gotten it on my jeans and you don't want to do that. Um, and then I use my palette knife to apply it. And it really works pretty slick. You can be very accurate with it. Um, and I would never go back to using a brush again. So. <laughs> and then of course you use a rubber cement pickup to take it all off, which I'll probably demonstrate that too. So. I kind of did my prep work um, with some of the masking fluid. I took my palette knife with a. Could you just hold that up so we can see? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I took my palette knife and I really slapped it on my hand, and then I created all those little irregular looking dots down below because I didn't want it to look regimented. I didn't want to paint them in so it looked contrived. I wanted to. To look more irregular as what things are in nature. So I just grabbed some masking fluid and I did this and I really kind of just splattered it down. So that being said, and to speed up today's workshop, I normally work wet on wet, but today I'm going to work on the dry surface so it has a little bit quicker drying time and I did bring my hair dryer also to, to kind of get that started. So if I need to. So um, at the end, I am going to add a little bit of casein to the mix um, for the foreground to cover up the base. And we'll talk about casein later if you're not familiar. It's part of the water media family, but um, it's opaque. And I just use white and I add it to any of my watercolor paint and it just completely changes it. So it can have a completely different palette with that. So I'm just going into my cerulean blue, nice sky color. I don't want it too thick and heavy because again, it's gonna look really powerful because I'm not diluting it with the wet on wet surface. So let's see what we have. Ah, that's maybe a little too bright for me still. So I'm gonna add some water to that to thin it out. So I want this background to be nice and rich with the value of a good color so that the aspen or the birch trees show up for me. So now I'm gonna swap that out for another color. I'm gonna have some more foliage looking. I, those of you who've worked with me before, you know I love Naples yellow. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna throw in some Naples yellow, get that started. And it's commingled with a little bit of the blue on my brush already. I'm totally okay with that. I want a variety anyway. And before that edge dries, I'm going to go into that with a little bit of color. So I'm always mindful of that drying edge. And again, I've got my K 
casein, I can go into that. Now, if you're using casein in addition to watercolor, it would be considered mixed media, of course, right? So because of that, you know, it adds another level of interest to it. And I'm not so much a purist that I, that I only use watercolor. I use whatever it takes to make the painting the way I want it. So I'm not, I'm not a purist that way whatsoever. And I'm commingling a little bit of um, quinacridone coral, excuse me, gold into it. I'll get to the coral later. I love that color. So you can see, now I've, I've actually drawn in some tinier birch trees way, way back in the distance. I'm not sure if they'll end up looking like birch trees or just little seedlings at this point, you know, perspective-wise. We'll, we'll see what happens with that. So I'm going to go into a little bit of green. I like to split the difference in between some hooker's green and some sap green. And I could grab a little bit more of the cerulean blue and put that family back into it as well, just to show a nice variety. I like to stick within the same color families. Let's take a little bit more of that cerulean and add it up in through here. So at this point, I'm sure, you know, I could add some salt to it, you know, get some texture going. I could force a burst by adding little clumps of, of water. But there's not much background here to begin with. It's more about the trees. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to have a variation of color and just let it be. You know, just let it kind of be what it wants to be. And if some of the strokes show up, that's okay. Now I'm going to make this pretty good, nice and rich down and through here. Because I'm going to go over that later with the casein. So I want to have a nice dark area down and through here. I might even add a little bit of purple to that. Let's grab some. <clears throat> Do you use newly squeezed out colors? or? Nope. I just let it dry. Um, that's a great question. I let it dry on my uh, palette because I'm traveling so much. But even at home, I and an, another thing with paint, you never want to squirt it down. You know, I see so many people, they get to a class and they're squirting it down, everything to get it activated. All you got to do is touch your brush to it. Every time you spray it down with moisture, with water, two things are happening. You're, deterior you're deteriorating the gum arabic, uh -huh. and you're, you're also diluting the pigment. And there's really no reason to do that. A third thing is you're creating a possibility of mold growth on it as well, especially down here in Florida with how moist it is down here for you people. So I'm going to go into this. So really, my and look at how glistening my paints are. There is no water on any of these except the ones I've gone into. I think it's at a good stage. I'm going to take a little bit of that paint off from where the masking tape is, just to kind of sop up some of that moisture. So you can see how ragged I just left the bottoms of these trees. They are going to be, at some point, really kind of nestled into um, foliage with the, using the casein. Has anybody used casein ever? I know some of I think I bought it from you and, and, and never class. used it. I'm yeah. glad you are going to show it's us. Probably, it's probably dry in your tube by now. <laughs> can, can you reconstitute it? No, it's, 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 like a, it's like acrylic that way. When you squirt it out, if you don't use it right away, it dries and it's dead. It's, There's, it's not like watercolor where you can go on and on and on with it. Um, take a palette out after five years and it's good to go. Watercolor is great that way. There's never any waste. But um, with the casein, it, does, uh, it dries and it's dead. You can't. You can't it's get like it back. Acrylic. Okay. Like acrylic, absolutely. Mm -hmm. like acrylic. It's <laughs> opaque. <laughs> it's opaque, yes. Um, basically, this is the oldest paint known to man. Mm -hmm. It is exactly what the cavemen used 
with their ground pigments, whatever they were using, their ground up stone or leaves or whatever they were, berries, um, and they would, in order to make it flow off their hand, their twig or whatever they were using to apply the cave drawings, they used milk byproduct whey. And that's exactly what this is today. And I'm going to open it up. We can pass it around because I'm not going to need it until the end. And because it's way, you can imagine it would smell really bad. Well, when I'm painting with this, Dave thinks I'm, I've been cleaning with pine saw all day. Because it, <laughs> I mean, it really, it really has that kind of disinfectant. And what it does, it preserves the paint as well. It preserves the pigment. So it, it has that kind of a pine saw quality to it. So, but it's opaque, it can go to semi-translucent, but it can never be transparent. So it's, it's a wonderful tool to have. It looks like toothpaste. You better be yeah, it, what you and it about. comes in all different colors. It comes oh. in an array of colors, but I only use white. I only, you know, I sell white because I can mix it with any of these paints and I can have a completely different palette. Because as you know, if you wanted a, a pink, you just thin out your red with water and you use the white of the paper to create your pink. Well, if I add a little touch of that to my red, I got pink like you can't imagine. I mean, it's real pink. Or, or to um, phthalo green, it turns out like mint green. It gives you a completely different color voice with the addition of one simple thing. Do you have to be careful, careful not to contaminate your watercolors? Do you use a separate color? You know, I'm to not too, on? I'm not too fussy about it. I'll, I will squirt it out, you know, in a little pan or something, keep because I don't have any space for it here. Right. But um, if my brush has a little bit of it on and I want to go into orange because it makes a beautiful dreamsicle orange with just your permanent orange, it's gorgeous. Um, if a little gets on there, then later I'll just wet it down and then it'll come off. Okay. Yeah, it, it's not too much of an issue. So I'm going to hair dry this. Oh, question. What's the difference between this and gouache? There is a di oh, the only difference is the byproduct of weight in that, and gouache has a different vehicle to suspend the, the pigment. It's just the difference in what Results suspends the vehicle. Results you get a different result? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is the most compatible with uh, watercolor because if... Let's say I'm. Let's say I didn't want to do this with my trees, and and save the white of the paper. I could do the whole background like I just did, but cover the whole thing, and then later take my white casein and go right over and paint my trees in with the white casein, oh and it's so compatible. It's not shiny. It's not dull like the gouache. Oh so it really looks like it. It fits. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to quickly hear this. Can you, can you use gesso? Yeah, but I don't think gesso is meant to be a paint. Okay. A paint, you know what I mean? It's, it's for priming different areas for when you're painting with acrylic or oil. Uh, because usually when I take things off, I want to make sure everything is completely dry. And I usually let things dry overnight on its own, just, just to be safe. So when I take off uh, masking fluid, I just don't rip it up. I kind of take it and I go very slowly. And I see how I keep it very close to the, to the page, mm -hmm. rather than just yanking it off. I've seen a lot of people you know, rip the paper up because... I really, again, I like this That's because it, it just has the color of it. It's just a nice little blush color to it, so I know where it is, but it's not, 
It's not disturbing me like it's not green or... In my book, I used the My Mary um, masking fluid, which I loved. Um, but it's green, so it showed up really well for illustrations in my book. So that's why I used it for that one. Okay, never use your finger to get off the... Because that'll add oils to... And I want to leave some of this background stuff on, the little grasses and things like that. I want to leave that on. But everything else on the tree can come off. And it's coming up pretty nicely, actually. Sometimes I don't bother with edging the masking tape with, um, with the masking fluid. I'll just make sure that I really burnish down those edges with my fingernail. I sometimes will rip the um, masking tape mm -hmm. in half. Yes. So that the ripped edges are the outside of the tree. Yes, so and, I, and I did texture. that. Yeah. I absolutely did that too on this one. You can see that edge is a little yeah. bit more unusual. <laughs> And again, I think, you know, if you're a beginner student and working on a landscape or a floral can be so forgiving because everything in nature is so irregular. So it's not like doing a portrait where if one eye's going one eye the other way, you might as well make it into an abstraction because <laughs> you're not going to call it realism. So I'm going to quickly get this off. And look at how this just it pulls off like it's a balloon. And I have had this, this masking fluid on my paintings for two years. And I'm thinking, oh, that's I'm never getting that off. It's gonna be dry, it's gonna I'm never getting it off. And it pulls off like a balloon, like just like I'm doing it today. So it really lasts a nice long time. But again, think, it's no no, it's the Jack Richardson brand. Oh, Jack Richardson. But it's um the the key thing is thinning it out. If you're um, using this particular brand and you're sculpting it on, you know, you're putting it on with a uh, palette knife and it looks like you're sculpting it, like it's getting three-dimensional, it's way too thick. And I just take a little eyedropper and I kind of sneak up on diluting it a little <coughs> bit at a time. With water, water, right? Just plain water. Okay. Yep, just plain water. I, masking fluid is a blessing and a curse. We've all been there. You get what you get with it. And even on my portraits, um, I use masking, I probably use masking fluid on every painting I do. It's very rare that I don't. I don't think we'll need it tomorrow in class though, <laughs> for what we're doing tomorrow. Um, I make sure with the masking fluid that everything I put down even if it's a highlight on a cheek, a highlight on a nose, a hair, whatever, that the whole shape is absolutely beautiful. Because when you take it off, you get what you get. And it's going to be a hard edge. You can always soften an edge, but yet if it's a beautiful shape to begin with, you have just really, you know, that's half the battle. How do you fix it if you... You know what? I would let it dry and then take it away and <coughs> put it on again. Yeah, but let it dry first. Then it's Waterford by Saunders. It's made at the oh. Saunders Mill, and that's what I have back there for sale. It's exactly the same thing, the same texture, the same weight. And I'm using 140. Now, and you know, I had a lot of stuff on here. I had resist where it was staying dry because of the masking fluid. I had it wet. Look at how flat that is. I even dried it with a hair dryer, which makes some papers buckle. It stays perfectly flat. And look at these, how they're painted right out to the edge, and it stays perfectly flat. So 140? I, 140. Wow. So I can paint off to the deckled edge, and then I can frame it in a floater frame to show the deckled edge, which I, I enjoy that a lot.